people assume that because I have the name Onyeka, which is an Ibo name, written I-G-B-O or I-B-O, that therefore I must be Ibo, even sometimes speak to me in Ibo, and I have nothing against that. I love to hear African languages, however they're spoken. Um, and they assume, therefore, that I must be Ibo. And I'm actually quite upset if I got invited to uh, an association only of Ibos, people were assuming that I was Ibo, and I had to tell him that I am not Ibo, uh, in that sense of the word, that I don't have a direct heritage that is Ibo. And therefore, they want to know, well, how did you get such a name? Believing, therefore, that Africans are divided separately, and that the names that we have only pertain to certain groups of Africans. And that if you have a name that pertains to a particular national grouping, you must therefore be of that national grouping. But my grandfather didn't have such a perception. So when he was younger, he said to his mother, my grandmother, that his second born son, grandson, me, should be Onyeka. But since none of those relatives of mine were Ibo, they said, we're not going to give uh, the second born grandson such a name. They gave me another name. So when I was about 17, 18, I had a relationship with a sister who wasn't Ibo either. Uh, and she said to me, hmm, that name that you've got, it doesn't seem quite right. I'm going to meditate upon this. Uh, you seem to be someone like Onyeka. I said, OK, that name. Don't know if I like that name. I have to think about it. I did think about it, meditated on it. OK, I like that name, but I'd only use it when I write. I'll be Onyeka when I write. So when I was writing, I used to write as Onyeka. And it kind of started, oh, it's Onyeka, it is Onyeka. And Yeka. it kind of fitted. And I thought, OK, I actually like this name. It actually appeals to me. So I went to West Africa, and there was an old man there who also is an Ibo. And uh, he said to me, oh, a name. The name was actually the Yoruba version of the same name. But he said, you can either use that name or Onyeka. Second strike. Second strike. I said, OK, all right. All right. That's like the second strike. So I took that. I said, OK, this is the second time now. I've had it from an older man and a younger woman. So this is twice now I've been called Onyeka. So when I wrote more and more, I just stuck with the name Onyeka. Wherever I was in public domain, that was my name. My mother found out that I was calling myself this name when she read one of my books. Oh, you're calling yourself Onyeka now, she says. Why are you doing that? I said, because I'm, it's, it's appropriate. Mm. What do you mean, mmm? Not you don't agree or disagree, just mmm, like you've heard this before. Yes, yes, I have. I said, what do you mean you've heard it before? What are you not telling me that I'm supposed to know? Oh, that was supposed to be your name. I said, what? Yeah, yeah, yes, yes, yes. My father, your grandfather said it should be your name. I said, then why on earth didn't you give it to me? Oh, I'm not Ibo. Oh, I don't like the name. I said, I said, it's not about what you like. That's like the third time in my life that I've been told I'm supposed to have this name. And you would have saved me a lot of pain and struggle if you'd just given me the name I was supposed to have. So um, that's how the um, name Onyeka came about. Um, and uh, that's <laughs> uh, what it's about. Yeah. Names relate to a spiritual identity, not just a physical or cultural one. When you take on a name, you take on a spiritual lineage. I was supposed to be on Yekka because it takes on a spiritual lineage, not necessarily a cultural lineage. Words and sounds have a certain kind of emotional power. The vibration of sounds, words, names give rise to that power. When you say the name, you give rise to that vibration. That vibration echoes not just within this world, but within the universe. When we say our names, we are saying and echoing that vibration. That vibration echoes through our spiritual lineage, which stretches back thousands, perhaps millions of years, and also resonates with our spiritual essence. And that spiritual essence has a root that goes back to the beginning of time, even before time itself. Uh, and so therefore, the names that we choose are very important and no joke. When we are growing from a small, round 
cuddly bundle of joy that we are as babies into the elongated, more lengthy, more robust shape of adults. All of that is painful. When our bones grow, it's painful. When our limbs grow, it's painful. In anything that is good, there is pain. So therefore, why would we assume that in the shaping of identity, there wouldn't be pain? Since everything in nature that is natural requires pain. And in order to achieve anything, requires work. And when you go through that work, you feel pain. The pain that you feel and the amount of work that's required produces a certain kind of person. The essence of what we are is produced from the work and the pain. The more work we put into what we are and the more pain we have been through produces an essence of a person of a higher vibration. Those people that don't want to work and suffer pain, their vibration is at a different level. Those that have been through certain work and suffered certain pain, their vibration is at another level. So, in terms of identity, identity and the forging of identity requires work and there is pain involved. National groups form themselves in pain, in bloodshed often, there was much destruction. In Europe, for example, there were two world wars. Those two world wars weren't just over control of the continent of Africa and the resources of the continent of Africa, although they were over that too. They were about national identity. They were about who are we as Europeans? What language should we speak? Should it be German? Should it be English? Should it be Polish? Whom should we pray to? What nation of people are we? And in the forging of that European identity, millions of people died, millions of people all over the world. And the whole world was brought almost to the edge of ruin because the shaping of identity is about work and pain. The destruction of African civilizations and the breaking up of the African continent in the Berlin Conference was about nationalism and identity. It was about pain, pain mostly that the African was suffering, and it was about work in the shaping of all identity, be it personal, community, or national, there must be a degree of pain and a degree of work. Now, what degree of pain and work? Either it can be pain or work that's enforced upon you, in which case you are the recipient of it and you become a victim to that pain, or it's work and pain that you yourself have set into effect to change yourself into something other than what you are right now as of yourself. So, for example, someone like Marcus Mosiah Garvey had a plan, a strategy about how to forge a certain kind of African identity. He knew that this forging of a certain kind of African identity would require a lot of work and pain. We weren't ready. We weren't ready to suffer that kind of work or pain. We weren't ready. We weren't ready in 1914. We weren't ready in 1917. We weren't ready in 1935. And we certainly aren't ready now. So because we weren't ready, something was enforced upon us. We are now suffering pain, but not a pain of our own making. A pain as a victim, as a recipient, because we were unable or unwilling to go through the pain that was being suggested. As a result, as you grow, you may well feel that life isn't about pain, um, isn't about work. You might think that things should just fall into your lap and that you should enjoy the riches of the earth um, without work um, and without pain. And therefore, that you can eat what you want, sleep when you want, sleep with whomever you wish, uh, do as you please, um, uh, and that therefore the rules that you adopt will be the rules that give you pleasure. And that you are no slave to work, but you're a slave to pleasure. Or you're a slave to the sensual aspects of your own being. Uh, you're a slave to your own desires. But you're still a slave. 
Such a concept then leads you to the point, such a concept leads you to the point where you forget the essence of life. And you, instead of making life work for you, you become somebody who, though you claim you are not about work, is living off the work of others. So this idea may well mean that when you think of pain, you think of something that you are trying to avoid. You think of something that you stay away from. Oh, I'm not going to go for that run today. Oh, I'm not going to read that book. Read a book. Why should I read a book? It's too much hard work. Oh, I'm not going to watch that play. Oh, that's too long. I'd rather just watch some cartoons. Oh, I don't want to think about that right now. Thinking hurts my head. Reading hurts my head. Oh, I don't want to be disciplined about that. That's too much pain in that. So all of that that you're doing is that you're actually avoiding life. And to a certain extent, you can run from life for a short period of time. But life has a way of waking you up to tell you that the way that you're living isn't correct. It may be that you suddenly get a bad heart. It may be suddenly that the children that you produced through living your sensual way hate your guts. It may be that your wife, the woman that you're in a relationship with, despises you. It may be that the family that you come from regard you as whatless. It may be the police knocking on your door because you've been smoking crack all day. Whatever it is, um, the thing is that you're doing, that sensual life, that pleasure-seeking life that you're having, eventually the world is going to wake you up, even if you were asleep, and tell you, no, 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 that's not going to work. But then people will say, there's so much pain, even in pain. They'll say, oh my goodness, to give that up requires so much effort. Surely it can't be right. It's so difficult. Surely that can't be right. Surely life's got to be easier than that. But no, it took nine months to create you. Nine months your mother had to carry you. Not one, not two, not three, but nine months. It couldn't be rushed. She was in pain for a large portion of the time that she was carrying you. Because she put aside that pain, she could not. As you were being born, there was pain. Because she put that pain away, no, that's part of the birth. So even in your attempts to cut yourself off from reality and avoid the pain, you can't do it because life is about that. Many people of African descent have an abhorrence to reading. Uh, they are generally afraid and concerned about reading. Uh, we, sometimes I feel that reading is like kryptonite. Like Superman is afraid of kryptonite. Africans are afraid of books. I used to work in a, a bookshop in Dalston 24, 25 years ago. And this brother used to come in, enormous brother. He's about six foot five and a half. Like this enormous brother. And when he came in, his shadow covered the whole shop. His brother used to come into the shop and stand there at the corner. He said, How are you doing? He said, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, there's a book. I said, Yeah, this place is full of books. Oh, there's this book. It's called Destruction of Black Civilization. I said, Yeah, it's a good book. And he would go to the corner of the bookshop in which this book was. Brilliant book written by Chancellor Williams. And he'd touch the cover of the book, uh, Destruction of Black Civilization. And I said, well, why don't you buy it? He said, oh, I can't buy it. My church says I shouldn't read it. I said, but listen, it's only a book. Oh. And then he'd break out into a sweat. And the sweat would start on the top of his head, <laughs> probably to the two of his toes. The sweat would break out profusely. Now he's sweating and he's panicking. He's having a panic attack over this book and he's feeling the cover of the book. Oh, but I want to buy it. I said, well, buy it then. Oh, but I can't. I said, well, why don't you have a look at it? He said, can I? I said, yes, you can. Oh, this book. And then he starts to read it like it's some sort of pornographic material. And he'd open up the chapters, chapter one, chapter two, chapter, oh, and he said this. I said, yes, he said this. And chapter five, chapter six. Oh, and he said this. Yes, he said, oh, I'd really like to buy it. Why don't you buy it? I can't. 
and so it would go on like this for some time with him becoming more and more excitable, sweating profusely and becoming excited over the prospect of this book. This book clearly had an effect upon his very being. We shouldn't be like that. I say to people to read anything and everything you can. And I do mean anything and everything you can. From Mein Kampf by Adolf Hitler, to the Bible, to the Quran, read everything you can. Only by reading as widely as you can do you expand your consciousness, your understanding, your knowledge. And I believe that all knowledge has benefit. And I do mean all knowledge. What makes human beings so powerful is their capacity to obtain, receive, produce, and pass on knowledge. So the historian is the custodian of the human race. The historian is the one who writes down the stories of the human race and teaches human beings about their own humanity. Historians are the ones who pass on the legacy of history to human beings and provide human beings with the understanding of what they yet may be. So book learning, rote learning, is a fundamental aspect of all human development, not just whether you want to be an academic, not simply because of being an African, but all human beings, everybody on this planet is meant to study and learn things. That's how human beings rose from their primordial, primeval swamp. Now, as people of African descent, we have a particular need to learn history. Our particular need is based upon our particular history. Our particular history has been shaped by our failure to understand historical precedents and our failure to act upon historical precedent. That's how we come to be in the situation in which we're in. This situation is that at present, um, people of African descent throughout the world are regarded as being or are in an inferior position. The position that we're in is not a good position. Throughout the world, being black, is regarded almost as a badge of dishonor. Many people of African descent want to run away from their own blackness. The texture of their hair, the color of the skin, the shape of the nose, the shape of the lips, even the color of the eye. The people that we regard as being superstars are people also who in many ways have run away from their own blackness and have sought to distance themselves from it. Even those who are unquestionably so do not tell or teach other people of African descent about their history. We have not got the kind of sports stars that we had in the 60s, 70s and 80s, early 80s, like Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali would go into the ring to teach a physical lesson and then outside the ring reveal a spiritual and intellectual one. I can't see Usain Bolt doing the same thing. So because of this, because of not understanding what it means to be African, because of a failure to perceive what it is to be African, by taking on a culture which is not African, and by African I don't mean Yoruba, Nigerian, Ghanaian, I said African culture, different I'm not talking about taking on a particular kind of continental cultural attribute that is related to a particular type of Africans and then saying that I am that. I'm saying taking on a culture which is African. An African culture is a culture that enables Africans to survive. An African culture is a culture that enables Africans to see. An African culture is an African culture that enables Africans to grow. An African culture is one which enables Africans to develop. An African culture is enabling African people to see themselves survive into the 22nd, 23rd, 24th and 25th century ad infinitum. That is the African culture that I'm talking about. And it is devoid of cultural aspects except those cultural aspects that enable Africans to survive. Nothing is in it for the sake of simply being culture. For example, 
People will say, um, oh, I do this, it's my culture. I said, but why do you do it? Why do you put Mark here and here? Oh, it's our culture. Yeah, but why do you do it? You did this as a reflection during the time of continental African enslavement, so that if you marked your face here and here, if you went a thousand miles, someone would know, oh, you're my brother, because you marked your face here and here. We're part of the same people. That marking here and here has a particular reference to European, Asian and Arab enslavement of African people. That's where that cultural tradition comes from. But you don't know why you do it. So you say, oh, it's my culture. That's not good enough for me. We need a culture where people are able to understand why they do what they do. The culture must be pragmatic. It's pragmatism based upon what enables Africans to survive, not cultural motifs that are about show. If it doesn't work to wear kinti, don't wear it. If it doesn't work to wear dashiki, don't wear it. If it doesn't work to wear agbada, don't wear it. We must understand the country in which we're living in. Because we're living in it. We must know and understand what is the nature of this country because us understanding that will enable us to survive. If we do not understand the country in which we are in, then we will not survive. I put on my dashiki, I put on my, my, my kinti cloth. I'm all right, no. Your, 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 your kinti, your, um, your dashiki, is not racism proof. It's not bulletproof. It's not prejudice proof. What it is, is a cultural motif, which you may choose or choose not to wear, but it doesn't mean that you understand. So in order to survive, you must know the place in which you're in. So therefore, people of African descent, living in England, born in Britain, must understand the nature of the country in which they live in and they must understand the history politics and identity of that nation without understanding that we get lost and wider than that we must understand globally how things are if we don't understand that we get lost so this requires us to do a great deal of work the first thing that we have to do, we have to know our own particular local family history. We must know about our own genetics, our fathers, our mothers, our grandfathers, our great grandfathers, as far back as we can go, at least five or six generations, if you can. We must know the root of their particular origin for our physical lineage. We must meditate on our spiritual lineage so that we know about our spiritual lineage, which may be very different from our physical lineage. We must then know the historical and spiritual lineage of the people in which we reside. In other words, we must know about Africans in Britain. We must know about the history of Africans in Britain. Then we must know about the history of Africans in Europe. Then we must know about the history of Africans in the Northern Hemisphere. Then we have to know about the history of Africans globally. And we must know continental African history as well, since it is the root of African identity.